Everywhere that we work, we work because we are invited to be here. So we, as internationals, do not claim that we know how the Israeli occupation of Palestine is going to end. We take our leave from Palestinians, and we also take our leave from Israelis working with Palestinians, those groups who are here working on the ground. Um, our hope, of course, is that ultimately we will create a world where there is peace and justice, where there is a level playing field. We have a long way to go. So the kinds of things that we do here is we provide daily accompaniment for Palestinian children going to school, and I'll talk a little bit more about these as we go through the slideshow. Uh, doing a lot of monitoring at checkpoints, at roadblocks, um, throughout the day we also go out because many times soldiers will go uh, and they will walk through the old city, it's generally groups of six, uh, and they will stop every man or and or boy who's a 15-ish or up um, and check their ID. Um, so we are, and many times we'll get calls like that's going on. We get calls when there are arrests or where there are detentions. Um, we got a call a few nights ago because a, a family that is very near Kiryat Arba, which is one of the uh, settlements, and I'll show you a map of that, uh, was throwing stones at this family. They started at about uh, six. The settlers, Israeli settlers, were throwing stones at them. Um, we got the call around 10, and so they wanted us to be there. They had called, um, they had contacted the Israeli military. Soldiers had, had shown up, had stopped it for the time that they were there, and then once the soldiers left, the rock throwing continued. And so we were asked to be there because many times our presence, the simple fact that we are there and we are watching, and also other monitoring organizations will um, stop what's going on or at least diminish, de-escalate it. Um, we can't always do that, but that is always our, our hope. Uh, supporting Palestinian nonviolent resistance in coordination with Israeli and international organizations. One of the things that's happened here in the last year, uh, and of course this is not unusual, but um, up in the area of Tel Ramada, and when you get the rooftop tour, you'll see, you'll get a general idea of where that is. Uh, a family's uh, almond grove was taken over, and it was said that it was uh, for archaeological purposes, and so they took, they leveled it, uprooted all of the olive trees, and they are now doing excavations there. And so that family um, was there, was trying to stop them from, from uprooting their almond grove. Um, it, it didn't work, but, but they asked for us to be there as a supportive and a, a documenting presence. So it's those kinds of things that we do. What we have here is a map of the area. One of the things that is unique to Hebron uh, is not thankfully the case in any other Palestinian cities, is that there are actually Israeli settlements right in the middle of the city. And so when you walk through Hebron, you will notice that there are, as you walk through this old city area, you'll notice places where there is horizontal fencing. And the reason that that horizontal fencing is there is because there are settlers literally living above this area, and they throw things down. Um, so you'll see trash um, in, in that, in that fencing. Um, since that fencing has been there, they may not throw solid things as much, but they may throw urine, uh, or they may throw water with fecal matter. Um, last year in the summertime, uh, over the area that is the textile market, where they sell a lot of clothes, they threw bleach. Um, the settlers here have a reputation for being particularly nasty. Generally, when we talk about settlers, we talk about kind of two different kinds of settlers. Those people who are going to the settlements for economic reasons, because it is because they get a lot of subsidies, because it makes economical sense, and there are those who go to settlements like those in Hebron who are doing it for ideological reasons, who are saying, this is our land, we are coming to claim this land, it is ours, and ours only as Jewish land, and it does not belong to you, and we are going to do what we can to move the Palestinians out. That is uh, the reputation of those, particularly of those who live right here in the city of Hebron. Um, so we have several settlements. 
Um, again, I've, rather than pointing them out on the map, I'll just, they're, they're these pink areas, so these are the ones that you'll see as you're walking through. Then we have Kiryat Arba, where I was talking about that rock throwing the other day. It was a family who lived just along here that was getting rocks thrown from above because it's on a big hill, and then you have another there. This red street, this is Shahada Street, and you'll see this again from our route. Shahada Street used to be the main um, market area for Palestinians in Hebron, and during the Second Intifada, it was completely shut down. And what that means is that literally, and you'll see this, I hope, when you're walking around, overnight, the, the um, metal doors of the Palestinian shops were welded with a bar across them so that people could not, literally could not open their doors. Um, we actually are on Shahada Street. Our next door neighbor had a shop um, and, and, uh, and she could no longer access her home. And so actually we have a door that goes from our apartment through our little uh, kind of outside area that she goes through to access her home. From our roof you'll be able to see that there are other houses along the way or because people have their shop and then they have uh, their homes above where there are ladders and that is how people will access. So there's one in particular where you see a ladder up to the roof and then uh, they cut a hole in the ceiling so that they could get down in their home and now there's a, a structure over there. So that has been closed not only, um, so all of the shops were closed, so, so that's been more than 10 years that basically a lot of people have lost their livelihoods um, and have had to do a lot of things so that they could even access their homes. Uh, Shahada Street, shops are closed, Palestinian vehicles cannot go on there, and Palestinians cannot walk on Shahada Street. They are not even allowed to walk. I as an international can, you all as internationals can, Palestinians cannot. Um, so what that means that is that if you are going from point A to point B, a lot of times you have to go way up and around to get from one place to another. Um, so what you see here are two of the uh, main checkpoints that we monitor in the morning during the school. Kitun is one of them, and then the mosque checkpoint. Uh, and, um, so, so the mosque, the Ibrahimi Mosque, which is now divided into part mosque and part synagogue, it used to be that Jews and Muslims would be able to worship there as uh, together uh, in their own individual ways. Um, in 1994, during Ramadan, during Friday prayers, uh, a man from the Jewish Defense League, which is a radical Jewish organization, to, to put it nicely, uh, named Baruch Goldstein, went into the mosque and started firing on the people who were praying there. 29 people were killed, uh, several hundred were injured. At that point, the mosque was closed. Um, there was a curfew put on on the town, on the, on the city, there were riots, there was more violence, more people killed. When they reopened uh, the building, it was half mosque and half synagogue. So one side is the mosque side, one side is the synagogue side. Uh, to me that is essentially rewarding someone for having, uh, for having fired on and killing all those people that now part of it, that is synagogue. Um, anytime there are Jewish holidays, the mosque side is closed. The mosque checkpoint is closed. Uh, it means that people have to reroute their way uh, around. So one of our main, um, one of the main things that we do every day is that we monitor the checkpoints as children are going to school. This is the Gatun checkpoint, and um, we collect numbers of the number of girls that go through, the number of boys that go through, the number of teachers and, and other adults who walk through. How many of them have their IDs checked? How many of them have their bags checked? Uh, we share this information with UNICEF and with Save the Children so that they can put that in the broader perspective of what's going out around, uh, on all over um, this area. Last year when I was here at this particular <coughs> checkpoint, very rarely were there any problems. There were not, uh, kids didn't get their bags checked, adults usually went through with no problems. This year, on a nearly daily basis, um, there's tear gas thrown at the children. It happened this morning. The kids may or may not throw rocks before that happens. 
Um, <coughs> there was one morning that during uh, the time that we were there, there were 29 canisters of tear gas thrown at children. And even if the children are throwing rocks, uh, I'm sure you can agree that there are many better ways of dealing with that than, than throwing tear gas at them. <coughs> um, this morning, there weren't, uh, for almost the whole time that we were there, there were no, all the adults walked through there, no problems. Once that tear gas canister was fired, um, they were stopping every man who came through and checking his ID. There was one man who had walked through with uh, two little girls, and when he came back through, they checked his ID. And they gave it back to him, and he was walking away, and then they asked for him for his ID again. And so he had to stand there as other people were coming through. Um, it's just... And so many times it's arbitrary. Some people were stopped, many went through. So when you say that these checkpoints are for security, it, it doesn't make any sense because then they would be stopping everyone and they're not stopping everyone. Uh, and they may stop the same person day after day after day, even though the soldiers know people who go every day and they may stop them twice. So it's, is it tend to be the same, or is it always the same soldiers? Every day There's a the rotation. Place? There's okay. a rotation, but um, these checkpoints are run by border police, and so they uh, are here more permanently than the soldiers who are here during doing their compulsory military service. Border police are people who have chosen to continue on with their military service, so it's border policemen. Who and so, do they live here as well in the settlements, or would they? Uh, I believe they live on the bases. Military base. So here you see a, a boy having his bag searched. That doesn't happen very often, but sometimes when there is rock throwing, they will go ahead and, and search every um, every bag. Um, sometimes, of course, when they hold people, what it means is that school doesn't start on time because the teachers aren't there <coughs> to run the school. Um, when the mosque gate is closed, it means that there is a long detour because many of the kids coming from the old city uh, have to go through this and have to go through uh, either the checkpoint that I just showed you or another one in order to get to school. And so this being closed means they, they cannot, uh, there's the closed checkpoint and so what they have to do then is take that long circuitous route. So where they may be coming from here to get over here instead, that's what they have to do and it takes about a half hour as opposed to five to ten minutes to get around. That happens any time there are Jewish holidays. <coughs> when boys are stopped, they are manhandled like that. Um, they're treated pretty roughly. Sometimes what we'll hear when we show up, like we haven't been told about it, but we'll be walking through and we see that this is happening. And then when we talk to the, uh, the boy or the man, he'll say, well, just before you arrived, they were kicking me. And so the, just the fact that we are there means that things are hopefully going to de-escalate. Um, and so that abuse that would have happened where they're not watching eyes uh, don't, don't happen. There was, uh, last week, there was a man who, who was stopped at the checkpoint. He was held for a, a long time there. And then there's a thing that has a, a porta potty in it, but it's got big concrete things around him. And they took him behind that. We don't know what they did to him there, but it, it was very disconcerting to watch him be taken out of our sight where we couldn't see what they were doing to him. Um, and so often it is men and, and boys. Sometimes it is young children. Young, young children. And when it is the tear, tear gas, for example, this morning there was a little girl. She was probably no more than five. The tear gas had just been shot off. Um, we asked her if she would like us to walk with her to just navigate through that. And she said no, um, much to our dismay. Uh, we did give her an alcohol pad so that to uh, hopefully keep, kind of protect her from the, um, from the tear gas. She went through and she came back a little bit later. Um, so we do ask the kids, do you want us to walk with you? <coughs> so many times, you know, when they do these searches, it is every person. And they may say, if we ask the soldiers, they'll say, we don't have to tell you why we're stopping people. Um, they may say it's because of rock throwing, and they may say, because we're bored. Literally, we have heard that answer, we're doing this because we're bored. 
Settler tour. Every Saturday, uh, there are settlers and Jewish tourists who are paraded through the souk, through the uh, old city area, accompanied and surrounded by large groups of soldiers. Uh, many times on Saturdays, uh, the shop owners will close their shops early because of harassment uh, from particularly from the settlers, from the people who are in the group, sometimes from soldiers um, when they're people who are trying to get through and get past them. Many times they are stopped, they're not allowed to go through, so they also have to reroute themselves or wait until the tour has passed. Many times uh, the soldiers will go up on the roof, meaning that they're going through Palestinian homes, uh, of course without permission to access the roof so that they can look down uh, look down on this. There were the last couple of weeks, not, I wasn't here this last Saturday to say, but, but Saturday before it was a group of, I would say, middle to high school boys, and as they were going through, uh, they were jumping up and down, they were chanting, they were shouting, um, they had a big Israeli flag that they kept holding up. Um, it was, I found it very disconcerting. It, it felt like, uh, to me, I, I used to teach in an all boys school. Um, felt like being in a pep rally, but a very hostile kind of pep rally. So often, this is what you'll see. Small children who are standing and looking at and trying to get past heavily armed soldiers. And what is interesting is that depending on what battalion is here, the mood changes. So there are some where, you know, it is, it is much more difficult for Palestinians when particular battalions are here and a little easier, which isn't to say it's easy because they still have to go through all of this um, when other battalions are here.